this this short introduction, but by one result, which was a, a follow up um, um, result by Klepsin and Narski following these um, this this first paper by Wodetsky, Yashenko, Klepsin and Narski, that they proved that uh, on manifolds which are at least three dimensional, um, there is an open set U such that when you pick any diffeomorphism in this set, there is a locally maximal partially hyperbolic. So I hope that you can understand my my previous my my, my abbreviations of partially hyperbolic um, sets, which carry a non-hyperbolic measure. And moreover, this non-hyperbolic measure has some full support. So there is non-hyperbolicity, very much typical, at least in some open um, set of dynamics. And so let me just say that uh, they, how they proved this, they used uh, a method which, uh, well, sometimes is also called the periodic approximation method to construct non-hyperbolic ergodic measures, which followed um, a line of previous works, works for example, by Katot Stepin and the mentioned paper by Gorodetsky, Ilyashenko, Klepsin, and Nasky. Okay, so we would like to understand what uh, um, um, to what extent ergodic theory can describe um, or detect or measure quantify non-hyperbolicity. And I will most, well, our long aim, long-term aim to is to understand uh, partially hyperbolic C1 diffeomorphisms. And uh, so to exclude the trivial cases, you would like to study a, a, a diffeomorphism, which is not hyperbolic. And to simplify, we focus only on partially hyperbolic diffeomorphisms. So there are, uh, we assume that there is always a splitting into uh, uh, three bundles, one stable, one unstable, and the middle is a central bundle. And we assume that this is one dimensional and that this dynamics is also not trivially splitting into uh, uh, components which are distinct. So we assume we always consider transitive, topologically transitive dynamics. And moreover, we assume, or we want to focus on systems which a priori have uh, saddles, that means periodic hyperbolic points of different type of indices. So here on the on the right, there's just a figure for, uh, let's say, two, two fixed points uh, of different type of hyperbolicity. So the unstable, the, the stable and the unstable part corresponds to the stable and the unstable direction, here one dimensional, and the central direction here one also one dimensional, here is of expanding type. So there would be one saddle where the central direction is expanding. And the other example is the saddle where the one dimensional center direction is contracting. So you have coexisting, I would like to consider systems where such saddles coexist in your system. And hence the hyperbolicities of different, of different type are present, coexistent in your system. Okay. And well, by domination, it follows that the central bundle is one of the oscillated uh, subbundles and defines a central Yapunov exponent. And from here on, I would like only to talk about exponents. And as we assume that it's one dimensional, it is given, measured by Birkhoff averages of this uh, continuous potential. And while well, this, this, uh, this uh, exponent can have negative values like in a saddle of this type, can have positive values like in a saddle of this type, but also can have um, measures which are non-hyperbolic. And hence the space of ergodic measures here in this talk, I will only talk about any measure that appears will be ergodic. Uh, so the space of ergodic measures splits into three components, uh, negative and positive exponent measures which are non-empty by hypothesis because we would like to assume that there are saddles of different type. And there may or may not be measures which are non-hyperbolic, which have central exponent equal to zero. Okay. So you have the hyperbolic and the non-hyperbolic part. And then <clears throat> some um, part in the middle that may or may not be empty. Okay, so 
Uh, we would like to study to, uh, to like to answer the question to what extent hyperbolic theory, the study of hyperbolic measures can detect and or measure uh, quantify. Non-hyperbolicity okay so and well depending on your point of view and preference you can uh, start to um, well of course non-hyperbolicity is the failure of hyperbolicity this is, this is uh, simple but you may also uh, in terms of of ergodic measures uh, have the following um, uh, three types of questions so first ask if the phase of ergodic measures the zero exponent is not empty. Okay. Second question you could ask if does there exist a point in your phase space such that the Lyapunov exponent, I didn't define Lyapunov exponent of a point, but it's just a book of average of this continuous function. So that would there exist uh, points which have a zero Lyapunov exponent. And the third type of question is, do there exist a sequence of measures whose exponent uh, converts to zero? So all these type of questions could be asked um, and then uh, about the system, which is non-hyperbolic, but uh, there may or may not be a, a measures or points which satisfy one of those, uh, answer positively one of the three questions. And then if you ask about how to quantify non-hyperbolicity in the first part, for example, in the first question you could ask, what is the, uh, if you take a measure which is non-hyperbolic and bodic, and look at its entropy, and you could ask, what is the supremum of all the measures of the value? <clears throat> And the second question you could ask, look at the set of points which have zero exponents. How big it is? So for example, dimension, and here I would like to look at the topological entropy of the map on the set. So quantify how big the part, the non hyperbolic part is. And then the last one, if you say, Again, entities which have exponents of measures which have exponents given alpha. And then you take the supremum of all those entropies, okay, measures, and then you let alpha go to zero. What is the value? So how big is the the non -hy the hyperbolic part which has exponent close to zero? Okay, so these are all three reasonable questions you may want to answer to in order to quantify how much non hyperbolicity is in your system. Okay, so, and well, okay, so let me be a bit more precise about uh, Systems which said is uh, which which be a bit more precise about uh, systems you would like to study. Uh, so uh, we we did did succeed partially to understand this general setting of uh, partially hyperbolic diffeomorphisms, which are non-hyperbolic, and there are two uh, key hypotheses which we used. Um, which were essential for our constructions. One, the first one is that there are, um, well, there always exist by partial hyperbolicity the strong, the stable and the strong unstable foliation tangent to the stable and unstable bundle. But uh, we require that these foliations each are minimal, so each uh, leaf is dense in the manifold. And the second hypothesis, which is a key hypothesis for our approaches, is the existence of plantar horseshoes. Plantar horseshoes, as I would later, I give a, I give a, will give a picture, but they are just very special uh, basic sets. 
And well, inside uh, the class of robustly transitive non hyperbolic diffeomorphisms, uh, it was shown that such properties are true in an open and uh, dense subset. But, well, this is um, by, done by, by a number of people. But um, moreover, is it, a, it is a consequence of the, the coexistence of settles of different of different hyperbolic type of hyperbolicity and the uh, um, uh, minimality of the strong stable foliations that we have uh, reach homoclinic relations and in particular there exist horseshoes so you can connect like here in the picture you have two saddles uh, um, associated two two saddles two fixed points of of contracting type and they are um, stable and unstable manifolds they intersect transversely giving rise to uh, a horseshoe. And there are plenty of horseshoes. In fact, they, they can be, uh, they, there is a saturation of, of horseshoes of either type of hyperbolicity. And when I say of either type of hyperbolicity it depends on what's the type and the hyperbolicity in the central direction. So you find these horseshoes of this type and horseshoes of that type uh, given by these homoclinic relations. <laughs> not very precise. Uh, in most of the examples we consider, they are dense. Yeah, each of them. However, um, they are also non-hyperbolic ergodic measures. So, besides the dense dense um, subset of 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 horseshoes of each type, there also exist uh, ergodic measures, non-hyperbolic ergodic measures, and they have been constructed in a number of uh, articles. For example, by uh, by by Bocchi, Bonatti, Diaz, Bonatti, Diaz, and Kvietniak. So with, they can be constructed with with positive entropy. They can be constructed with full support. <clears throat> so here I I give some some key uh, key uh, references of works that have dealing with the construction of non-hyperbolic ergodic measures. Mostly those constructions they use, uh, for example, uh, flip flops. Flip flop is a compact invariant set where each point has zero exponent and tends by the variational principle carries um, um, non hyperbolic ergodic measures. Moreover, the entropy on those flip flops is positive and hence there exist uh, non hyperbolic ergodic measures with positive entropy. Nevertheless, those um, the entropy is not necessarily, um, well, you lose some entropy in this construction. So a priori, you have moreover no control about the entropy on these con constructed flip flops. Okay, so, uh, well, studying partially hyperbolic C1 diffeomorphisms is very complicated. And uh, even if you assume these properties to be satisfied, let me just uh, give, um, let me give a, a glimpse of an idea of the, uh, the uh, properties we use in our constructions to, for example, to to prove one of the theorems, some of the theorems that I would like to show. So the uh, these properties that the, foli the strong uh, foliations are minimal help you to permit the concatenation of orbit pieces. So here I, this is just a picture of one of the proofs that we use. This would be a, a blender. And you can, by minimality of this, uh, the, the foliation, you can connect one point which has a certain property uh, behavior in in with the blender with the property end and then you take also the other foliation which connect into the blender and then you can construct by hand uh, orbits with the given uh, behavior in particular orbits with zero exponent okay but i decided to shift a bit um, the focus in this talk so i will not going to talk about these methods which cover for example some some another effect or partial hyperbolic dynamic and some DA diffeomorphisms, but I would like to talk about the skew product models. Ah, so I forgot that you wanted to show you a blender. This is a, a, a picture from the midnight discussion of the inventors of the blender and the point of view of them. What is a blender? Okay. So there are two versions and two inventors and two versions. But let me talk about the. Um, um, so we, we would like to study uh, systems uh, with, so on the, in the long run, we would like to understand uh, 
And we uh, go the, the path of um, uh, gradually study systems with increasing complexity. So uh, the, uh, the work of Klepsin and Nalski and Gorodetsky, Klepsin and uh, Iyashenko, Klepsin and Nalski also, they, they started by studying uh, that few products. Of the type that you have a symbolic system in the base to the ship, and then a fiber map which depends only on the first symbol. And they use the, the, the analyzed step cube product and found, for example, the, the constructed non, non hyperbolic ergodic measures. And then they use their findings for step cube product to gradually understand Q product. which are more general in the sense that the fiber map may depend not just on the first symbol, but on the end of the past in the future. And uh, eventually the path to understanding the, the may say so that the, the smooth realizations of those Q products and uh, getting the results about uh, open sets or uh, different multiple sets. Um, not okay, so I would like to to go to follow this to what we are trying to follow this road more or less. And in my talk, I will focus on on step skew products. And and yes, so um, I will put the following assumptions. We call them axioms because of that we think that it's uh, the, the basis, the, the fundament of the, the, the understanding of partially everybody's dynamics, but it's their axioms, they are the conditions that make our theorems work. And also they have um, translations to uh, corresponding properties in partially everybody's dynamics. So let me first uh, explain what they are. So we assume we will consider uh, a set of products S with the um, shift and end symbols uh, in, the, in, the, in the base and C1 the homomorphisms in the circle fi in the fibers. So, the circle fibers. so we assume first that the uh, the Q product is transitive, meaning that the, the map at is topologically transitive. Uh, Second, uh, we assume that there is a so-called what we call blending interval, J, which has the following two properties. Uh, first, the uh, controlled expanding covering property. Uh, so there is some, some constant such that for any interval, okay, which is contained in J, there exists a word of some length in your and symbol, which has the property that if you take so your circle, then here is your interval J. You take any interval H. And then by this, by this word, this, uh, this the image of this interval H uh, covers the interval J. Well, it covers also there's some, some more hypothesis here, but let me just write a simplified version. And by this map at W, I mean, if you have a word given by these first uh, symbols, there's just take the concatenation of the corresponding fiber. So you find the concatenation of your, the fiber maps, which map this interval into one, which covers the blending interval J. And moreover, it does this in an expanding way, uniformly on this interval. Okay, so this is controlled expanding covering. Here, the uh, expansion factor doesn't depend on the interval. Okay, so then we have a second condition that is control expanding covering backwards, meaning that we require the same hypothesis for the inverse map. Okay, uh, then a, a third condition which we call accessibility, 
meaning that the orbit of J by the iterative function system so for all concatenations of those maps. So you take a, any sequence and iterate forward and backward those corresponding fiber maps, and the union of all those images eventually covers all those circles. Okay, so, well, because the circle is, uh, because the circle is compact and the, the fact that would be here, the, it's, it's sufficient to uh, suffice us to consider a finite number of words to have this covering property of the Okay, so uh, then you may look at the class of skew products which have these C1 circle fibers. Let's say you fix N and look at uh, all which all ones which are robustly transitive and which have a priori periodic points of different types. Then you can show that there is an open and dense subset of skew uh, products which satisfy this one. So it's a bit in the spirit of collection analysis. There are open sets of sets which are uh, maps which are defined as well. Okay, so we studied uh, two types of examples. And the first one comes, uh, we call blender models because there, in fact, there is a, a dictionary that comes, uh, that translates, that goes precisely this, this way. So you have your property. And you can translate these properties to corresponding properties and if you want to more in which way make uh, the things work. So here there's a better picture of, um, of a blender, which here in this case, it's a fine as a, a horseshoe with some it, um, overlap in the projection. So the, the two horseshoe legs and the projection of one direction, they overlap nicely. And on the right-hand side, there is uh, the model of what we call an expanding blender, which is here in the case, I just take one ma two maps from my iterated function system. And I assume that they have, uh, say one map has one fixed point, which is expanding. The other map has also a fixed point, which is expanding. And their branches is, are such that they overlap in some interval in between those two fixed points. So this would, uh, define an expanding blender. And the, so the, the, the example satisfying our axioms, which we call blender models, are set, uh, step skew products which have an expanding blender of this type. So there are some ma two maps, or maybe maps for some iteration, some concatenation of your maps from your iterated function system, which has uh, an expanding, uh, ex expanding blender of this type. Okay, and then you also assume that this is true for the inverse maps of the iterated function system, which we called a contracting blender. And last but not least, you need some, some property that your orbits are there. Well, you also want transitivity. So if you have, if you can prove that every point on the circle has some backward and forward orbit, which eventually enters this blender domain, uh, of a forward of an expanding blender and also of the contracting blender, then you have an example of a skew product which uh, satisfies these axioms. Okay. And as I said, there is a dictionary between these step skew products. So here, an expanding blender you can see as a C unstable blender horseshoe. Like here, there is one big picture. Contracting blender translates to C stable uh, blender horseshoes. And this property that every point has a backward forward iterate into the blender translates more or less to the property that these foliations, the strong foliations are minimal. Okay. So this is the first set of uh, examples we had. And ah, yeah, you can show that this is an open property. So for any set of maps, which are C1 close to the to one set of maps which satisfy these properties, then they, you also have these axioms. So it's an open property. You get lots of examples. Okay. So, and the second type of example that we, we studied are so-called contraction expansion rotation ones. And in particular, and that's the, the reason why I changed a bit the focus of my talk, they, um, Particular examples are the projective action of certain CL2 R cycles. So, for example, if you have one 
fiber map, it doesn't need to come from a from a, from a, co a matrix core cycle, but can a C1 fiber map, which is a small smell, and one which is, say, uh, just to simplify an irrational rotation. Then you can prove that uh, the, uh, so for n equal to, that these uh, SQ product with such, such fiber maps uh, satisfies those axioms. Okay. And in particular, you can uh, consider examples which do come from SL2R co cycles. So let me call H here a matrix which in its projective action uh, defines such a such a, a circle diffeomorphisms and R for rotation, one which defines such a such a circle diffeomorphism. And well, uh, this was not mentioned in the in the uh, other talks, but there is a classification of SL2R core cycles in, or matrices in types of um, hyper, hyperbolic, hyperbolic ones, parabolic ones, and elliptic ones according to their trace. And if you look at uh, the group generated by a finite number of uh, matrices, then there are two um, concepts uh, important and studied a lot. The first one is a hyperbolic one. I think it's uh, what um, Pablo was giving today the characterization, uh, a definition of hyperbolic, uh, hyperbolic uh, well, it was a, is a, a group, there was a measure also involved, which here a priori is not. So it's, they did this, uh, this generated group is called hyperbolic if there is an invariant cone field. So there exists a cone field, which is invariant for all maps in the group generated. Okay, which is such a core cycle, such a, finite set of matrices and its generated group uh, is called hyperbolic. And the second concept is elliptic, ellipticity. So you call um, such a co-cycle elliptic if they, it has at least one element. So one element of the group must be elliptic. So for example, if you have these, these two uh, maps, they, it has an elliptic element, and then it's not, oops, it's not a hyperbolic one. Okay, so there are some interesting things to say about elliptic and hyperbolic core cycles. For example, in in two papers by Yokos and one by Yokos and one by Avila Bakin Yokos, um, they proved that the union of those two sets, elliptic and hyperbolic core cycles, is open and dense in SL2R n, and the complement of the hyperbolic ones is the closure of the elliptic ones. So now you may wonder what about uh, those co-cycles that give rise to a skew product that satisfies these axioms. So uh, the, these two examples uh, I choose, this is one which um, provides one. You can now generalize these co-cycles uh, and we define the more or less in the in the spirit of, of this type that you, you would like to assume that there are some matrix, matrix, matrices which are hyperbolic, which have uh, which are have of hyperbolic type, but you would also like to have some matrices which are which are of rotation type to get this accessibility. And we can prove that um so as I said already, the example here is an elliptic one. And we can prove that there exists an open and dense set of elliptic, an open and dense subset in the elliptic ones, such that all uh, co cycles in this set, the projective actions define diffeomorphisms satisfying the axioms. So it's a large, again, a large uh, and open subset of, of systems which satisfy the axioms. <clears throat> so, okay, so we would like to uh, answer these questions. Uh, in, part in particular, we want to quantify non hyperbolicity. And what are the main tools? Uh, what are the main tools or main steps?
uh, for for our analysis is uh, first to have um, uh, hyperbolic, uh, hyperbolic approximation of one hyperbolicity. So this is a bit in the in the direction of um, which will prove that if you have a, a C1 plus epsilon diffeomorphism, C2 epsilon, which is the diffeomorphism as a hyperbolic measure of positive entropy, you can construct horseshoes whose entropy is close to the entropy of the measure and also approximate, for example, um, um, in Lyapunov exponent, the exponent of the, of the measure. And here we, we uh, obtain similar uh, results that if you start with a negative measure, which is uh, non hyperbolic, it has positive entropy, we, we construct horseshoes which have hyperbolic properties close to this, this measure. So we construct horseshoes with topological entropy is close to the entropy of this measure. And also in uh, Whose Yakunov exponents are close to zero. The second step is then to uh, uh, prove restricted variation interval. Okay, and the third one is to construct on non hyperbolic. Uh, Abolic measures uh, because, well, a priori, if you just assume these axioms and you are guaranteed uh, their existence, and you want to construct them with positive ones. Okay, so these are the, the three main points we proceed to do. And let me uh, mention some of the the the, re the, the results that we, that we did we obtained in this direction. So, uh, if you have a, so as I said already, if you uh, for any measure, if also there is an ergodic measure uh, which is non-hyperbolic, then you can a weak sign and entropy approximate this measure. Uh, and then, well, I didn't write a full theorem with lots of quantifiers, but what I mean, what I mean by this, that there is this um, sequence of horseshoes whose topological entropy is close to the entropy of the, of the measure you start with, and that any measure supported on each of these horseshoes is close to zero. I assume these axioms, yes. And so this is this was done assuming those axioms, and the results can be extended assuming these properties of minimal foliations and the existence of blenders for C1 partially hyperbolic, non-hyperbolic diffuse, which I'm not going to talk about. But can be done. It is done. Uh, okay. So here, in particular, we did this with with Bruno Santiago, and there's also um, some work by. Um, that were young and Chino <clears throat> Chang. Uh, okay, so the, uh, and the proof, uh, I'm not sure if I have time to, to say something about the proof at the end, it uses ergodic skeletons. So you, you have your measure, you find a good set of points which uh, approximate uh, ordinality close to the entropy of the, the entropy of the measure will approximate more or less the, the measure you get and you start. The final time they have one of the exponents on more to zero, and then you use these axioms by concatenating those over to, pro to produce by hand your horseshoe. <clears throat> okay, so this is the, the first step. And here I would like also like to point out to uh, in this in this task to understand or to quantify non-hyperbolic non-hyperbolicity in the system, you need to understand the um, the, the, the space of ergodic measures. So how many 
are there non hyperbolic meshes and how are they approximated by, by a hyperbolic one? And if they are approximated by a periodic, a periodic hyperbolic one, and all these results, which are which are known in systems with hyperbolicity, for example, by the work of Sigmund, now you have to reprove in non hyperbolic settings. So Sigmund, for example, assumes specification property to show his results of density of uh, periodic measures in the space of periodic uh, indirect measures. Well, in these systems, in these systems, you do not have the specification property. No way. So you need to reprove. Um, you need to understand the, the structure of of um, ergodic measures. Okay. So the second item is restrictive variation of principles. This tries to give answer to this type of question. We would like to quantify how much entropy is uh, in your non hyperbolic ergodic measures. And also, well, I start with the hyperbolic ones. If, if alpha is not zero, how much entropy is in hyperbolic ones? And in particular, uh, for measures whose exponent is close to zero. Okay, so for that, you study variational principles. So let me just recall uh, one of the one of the first results in this direction by Bo and the one of the, the key step. No, it's not the first result of Bowen, but one of the key key steps in the paper by Bowen from seventy three. Um, which well here I I didn't specify any dynamics, but this result in fact holds quite generally for a compact metric space in the continuous map. So this is the easy part of the variational principle. Well, it's not easy to the, 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 the most more general part of the variational principle. And um, so let me state a, a picture theorem for uh, skew products that satisfy these axioms. So the uh, you look at the, the function given fixing a value alpha, which could be negative, positive, or zero. And you look at the maximal entropy of measures who have precisely this this um, this exponent. Call this function e of alpha, and then you study this function in terms of alpha as a function. And the first result is that uh, its its domain is an interval. So it, of course, by uh, by hypothesis, it contains expansion and also contains contraction. So there are negative and positive values in this in this in this domain. And it's a it's a it's not hard to show that it's a compact uh, that, that uh, it contains the the endpoints. Um, it contains zero in its interior. Well, this you need to prove. But to prove this, uh, you use part of this result of hyperbolic approximation. In particular, you can show that if you have a an hyperbolic measure by Constructing. If you have an hyperbolic measure with exponent epsilon plus epsilon, you can construct a horseshoe whose exponent is minus epsilon plus some correction factor. So you can go from negative spectrum to positive spectrum by constructing new orbits and vice versa. So you get measures whose exponent is arbitrarily close to zero. And you can also, for example, following the these, these techniques of flip flops, you can produce a uh, uh, ergodic measures with non hyperbolic uh, uh, non hyperbolic ergodic measures so you uh, show that zero is in the interior of the spectrum uh, further there are uh, each time you you find an, a horseshoe a hyperbolic one for example of expanding type by classical results it comes with an interval of mm -hmm. It comes with an interval of values of Lyapunov exponents. So it comes here with an interval, not in training anymore from the pandemic. It comes with an interval of exponents. And then it's a result from multifractor analysis for hyperbolic systems that you get a corresponding fun function. I can't do this. 
to get a corresponding function. So this would be a con corresponding function of say, P of alpha of alpha for some, I don't have to touch them. Of alpha of some horseshoe, no, of some horseshoe you constructed. I think you get the idea. I hope that you get the idea. So there is some, there is some, each horseshoe defines also measures and, it, well, of expanding types. So you get the subset of exponents in this horseshoe. It's an interval that's part of the result of multiplex analysis and comes with a function that, in fact, is um is a smooth curve and sits below because it contains only some of the measures. Okay. And then you can concatenate. If you have one horseshoe of expanding type and another horseshoe of expanding type by those properties, you can connect them into a, a horseshoe which is contains the other two. So you get another curve on top of them. And then gradually you can you can exhaust uh, your system and you prove that this is so you get an, a, an increasing sequence of concave curves which mood supremum is a concave curve so you do this for the expanding type and for the contracting type and hence you get these uh these this figure which is um well it suggests that this uh, that we know already that it's differentiable in fact this figure is full of questions for example we know nothing about the general differentiability uh, and its regularity. I drew it with two numbers which have precisely two uh, extreme points, meaning there are precisely two numbers which uh, uh, give rise to measures of maximal entropy. In general, this is probably not true. For the matrix co-cycles, it is true because those uh, iterated function systems are proximal and for those systems it is known that there is uh, precisely two measures of maximum entropy one with negative exponent one with positive exponent so in this case you have precisely two two extremes but in general it is open and we are not able to show anything okay and moreover you can uh, also answer the the second question looking at the entropy of those points which have uh, well, in general, it come alpha and you look at the set of points with the NF exponent with that the alpha and you look at the entropy, and you can show that this is uh, equal to this E of alpha for any alpha um, in this closed interval. And this was quite some work in particular to show this for, for alpha equals C. Okay, so besides the the question about the regularity of this function. Uh, I hope that this figure is not, not more um, suggesting properties that are maybe hidden. So let me just point out that uh, the way of of obtaining this this figure is uh, on the right hand side. I have drawn the uh, uh, some pressure functions, which are also can be seen from this figure, this draws. So if you look at this number here, okay, this would be if alpha is positive, the function p plus of q. No, sorry, this one is not. So this would be the function p plus of q in this in this figure. So you look at the Lejeune transfer transfer transform of certain variational pressures for negative and measures with negative exponent and positive exponent respectively. Okay. And the last step in the analysis to quantify non-hyperbolicity non is to prove, to show that, to construct uh, ergodic non-hyperbolic measures. And here again, we followed uh, the paper by Gorodetsky, Ilyashenko, Klepsinaski. So let me just give a, a picture proof of their construct picture of their construction. They started with an periodic orbit of contracting type. So let's say that here the P is a periodic orbit and whose exponent was negative. 
And then by their hypothesis, which are quite similar to those, some of those properties from the axioms, they construct another periodic orbit, which has also Lyapunov exponent. Ah, the blue works. Yes, the blue works. So this would be lambda P2 sometimes, which has also Lyapunov exponent negative, but uh, it follows the first periodic orbit for some time, but then it does some sojourn, some uh, passage in a region where you have uh, expansion and then it returns to your periodic orbit and there's some more. So in the consequence, you get the periodic orbit, which has exponent close to the first one, but a bit less negative. And then you con continue this construction to construct another periodic orbit. And so you get a sequence of measures which are supported on those periodic orbits each time with exponent closer to zero. And at the end you get, you take the limit of those measures and they prove that this limit measure can be constructed to be ergodic. Okay. And in fact, uh, Dominique and Pietniak and Marta Wonska, they show that this F bar converges to an ergodic measure and hence uh, always a zero entropy. So if you follow this construction, you don't get positive entropy. However, if you modify this construction, so it's, and you can continue and talk a bit more, you can do more of the same trick and construct measures which are ergodic, non hyperbolic and positive entropy. So what do you what do you do in rough terms to replace the periodic orbit by horseshoes and do a similar construction, which is said like this sounds really easy, but it a bit more work, but you can prove the following theorem. Uh, if you define H0 being the, the uh, well, defined by, by, these, by these numbers. So if you remember this figure, alpha. So you would like, take alpha going to zero and you would like to take the, the limit value of those numbers that is realized by measures which are each time closer to the to, 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 to non hyperbolic measures. You can show that these two numbers coincide, that this number is positive and the result of the theorem is that this can be approximated arbitrarily by ergodic measures with entropy in entropy. So you get non-hyperbolic measures with entropy arbitrarily close to this number. Okay, so I'm running out of time. Uh, here's a more precise statement. If you start with one measure, uh, mu of exponent alpha, negative and positive entropy, then you can construct a sequence of ergodic measures, negative exponent whose entropy converges who, which, which converge to an ergodic measure of zero exponent and of entropy close to the entropy of the, started, the measure you started with. So you can approximate non um, this value. Well, moreover, one can show, we, we showed that uh, the sequence of measures can be chosen to be an F bar Cauchy sequence. So, uh, uh, I don't have time to explain this, but uh, in the consequence that the, the limit measure, which is a you need is, is ergodic that this we prove, but the limit measure is a loosely Bernoulli measure. So it's a Kakutani equivalent to a discrete suspension of the Bernoulli system. And let me just go back to the example of the uh, matrix core cycles, what this type of result has as a consequence for metric core cycles. So remember the example I took, Two matrices, one hyperbolic, one of rotation. This is irrational. You look at either the uh, matrices come, which coming from the um, concatenation or from the project, the maps from the projective action. And you may recall the result of Fürstenberg that is, if you take a Bernoulli measure on the base and you apply your your matrices one or the other, and you look at the uh, asymptotic growth rate of, of the matrix norm of those such a concatenation. 
then frozen back tells you that, uh, well, for this example, I don't wanna speak about the following hypothesis, but for this example, this exponent is positive. Or in other words, if you look at uh, the induced uh, projective action, the Lyapunov exponent of those uh, uh, skew product of these uh, C1 different morphisms in the circle, then this corresponds to a negative Lyapunov exponent. However, the result of our construction is that you can construct ergodic measures which are uh, non-hyperbolic and which are um, um, classified as weakly Bernoulli measures, which have positive entropy. And non-hyperbolic hands for almost uh, every uh, sequence, you get a zero growth rate of the matrix. Okay. Well, and then the last result, which um, I think I don't have time to speak about this for these matrix four cycles, you know that they are preferred in two uh, measures of maximum entropy, and this number is zero, which is the entropy, the topological entropy of sequences which have zero exponent, this number is positive, and this is less than the maximum. So, but I think I should stop. Any questions? No question. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so thank you again. We we convene in uh, at, at four. <laughs>